The Audi TT is, in my opinion, one of the best styled cars in the past 30 years, and I've put my money where my mouth is. I owned one for nine years. I loved every minute of it, even taking it around the track. But I'm waiting for the next car with a style so unique that I've just got to own it. It's a car that spanned four decades through three different guises and ended production in November 2023. So just where did the inspiration for the TT come from? What disaster struck just after it launched? And did the second and third generation improve on the TT formula? This is the Audi TT story. The 1991 Quattro Spider concept gave Audi a hint that a two-door sports car might be a moneymaker. The reception at the Frankfurt Motor Show was so good, the concept received thousands of pre-orders. It would never come to fruition. This was a mid-engined car, not based on any other platform, and so the cost to bring it to market would be too great. But what if they could use an existing car platform? Audi were working on a new small platform that will be shared by the fourth generation Volkswagen Golf, Jetta, Skoda Octavia, Seat Leon, second generation Seat Toledo and Audi A3, Audi's new small car. If they could use this for the Volkswagen Golf GTI, why not a new compact Audi sports car? Over in France, Renault were undergoing a styling renaissance all of their own under the hand of Patrick Lequemont. He delighted or annoyed the world, depending on which side of the fence you're on, with the Twingo, and the Renault Laguna and Scenic concepts had shown that this was a new Renault with big ambitions. Their next concept was equally startling, the Argos that was penned by Jean-Pierre Plouet, who would go on to become lead designer at Stellantis. Patrick saw a lot of German Bauhaus styling in that car, but being a French company, they could hardly claim it was inspired by Germans. So this new Argos concept will be inspired by the French equivalent of the Bauhaus movement, Esprit Nouveau, and would be shown at the 1994 Geneva Motor Show. As Patrick explains, the Argos got a lot of interest. Now, when we presented it at, um, at Geneva, this car had an enormous impact. You wouldn't imagine. We, I've never seen so many people on the stand. And mostly they were German speaking people. And I would say that there was everyone from Audi was there and lots of people from other German companies. One of Audi's designers, Freeman Thomas, had Bauhaus design aspirations of his own. So Audi asked him to come up with a design for a small sports car. He'd been working with Jay Mays to develop Concept One that would become the new Beetle. It had been shown just a few months earlier at the North American Auto Show with the Cabriolet version shown at the same time as the Argos. Just two months later, he had a Bauhaus-inspired design to show to Audi. And he was clear to draw a line between this car and the cartoonish Concept One Beetle design. He wrote, this coupe should feel serious and not childish. It was also very different from Audi's current and upcoming design language. The new Audi A6 and A8 that launched the year the TT was conceived, the Audi A4 that would launch a year later, and the Audi A3 that would come a year after that, all had the same styling. This new Bauhaus-inspired coupe, also inspired by Audis from the 1930s, was a completely new style. Jay Mays worked with Freeman on the design and he said, it was a systematic Bauhaus approach. I think the TT is unique in that respect because it's a non-automotive design language. It's architectural. It's very geometric as though it was milled out of a solid piece of aluminium. There are no flowing lines in Bauhaus architecture or furniture. Everything else at the time was fluid. Everyone was trying to make things look as if they would go faster and faster. We just took a completely industrial approach. The original vision was an open top, but it developed into a coupe, a soft top roadster, spider, and the same spider with a hard top. This was then whittled down to just two ideas, a coupe and an open top. The team created a series of quarter scale mock-ups that were presented to the board. With the promise it would use a shortened version of the Audi A3 chassis and so wouldn't cost a fortune to produce, the car was enthusiastically approved. Inside, Audi didn't make the same mistake Ford made with its retro-styled Thunderbird, whose uninspiring interior borrowed heavily from the standard Ford's parts bin. 
The buzzword for the TT's design was absolute no compromise. Romulus Rost realised an interior that was an equally absolute design statement inside. After all, that's where the owner would spend most of their time and the tactile feel of unique high quality components was important. On the test drive, of course, a potential owner also spends most of their time inside the vehicle and car buying like house buying has a large emotional element to it. So the team lent into the Bauhaus design with aluminium on the major controls, no cheap plastic here. Aluminium was chosen not just because it was associated with Audi's cars, it was used for the chassis on the new Audi A8, but it also seemed the perfect choice for a sports car being commonly used in motorsports. So the fuel filler cap would use the circle motif in aluminium and the same design was carried forward to the aluminium air vent inside. For the Roadster, the team decided on something a little different. The idea of using the coarse stitching and leather from a baseball glove. As the US was a big potential market for Audi's new car, this made a lot of sense. Volkswagen always had a deep relationship with Porsche. They built a sports car together in the late 1960s, the 914, and there was a proposal to make a Porsche version of VW's new Bauhaus creation. It made a lot of sense sharing the cost of development for a car that would have a relatively low volume. Designs were created and there was a big meeting between Porsche and Volkswagen that didn't go very well, maybe because Porsche were already working on their own entry-level sports car, the Boxster. Afterwards, Porsche came back with several demands. The VW version couldn't have more than 135 horsepower, whereas the Porsche version would have over 200 horsepower with quattro four-wheel drive, <laughs> borrowed from Audi, of course. This was a non-starter for Volkswagen, and the whole idea was abandoned. By spring 1995, the team had created a full-size clay of the coupe and the interior. They measured the final shape, took the roof off, and measured it again. They now had the final shapes of the coupe and the roadster. Sharing the A3 platform meant it would be easier to use its range of engines as well, the 1.8 litre four-cylinder. But Audi would go with a more potent version from the A4 that produced 150 horsepower for the coupe and a more potent 210 horsepower version for the Roadster. Audi was synonymous with its Quattro four-wheel drive system. It had been adapted for the A3 platform, so it was natural to offer that on the TT as well. It was decided to show the new car at the 1995 Frankfurt Motor Show, and Audi handed the work to build the concept off to Ital Design in Turin. The work took four months and was ready just a month before the show. There were a few hiccups before it was shown though. The electric windows gave out and the passenger door refused to open. But these problems were swiftly resolved and the new Audi TT appeared to a rapturous reception. This was a car just as radical as Renault's Argos but clearly closer to production. Was it Audi's intention to actually sell this car to the public? Where post-war Porsches had a look of a squash beetle, not that surprising as they were designed by the same person, Audi's new TT shared the same simple lines as the updated Volkswagen Beetle, again squashed but with a mature image that harked back to Audi's 1930s heritage. TT, as Audi explained, stood for tradition and technology. The press and public called for this car to be produced now, but Audi was stony-faced. The reason became clear seven weeks later when Audi unveiled the TTS concept. They wanted to get the public's reaction to both cars before making their judgment, although the reaction from the initial unveiling made this maybe the easiest decision Audi's management had ever had to make. Once the TTS had made its debut, it was a foregone conclusion. Both cars would make it to production. That's not to say that within Audi, the TT didn't have its detractors who saw the shape as ugly or at least inappropriate for Audi. They saw the company as technology-led with styling taking an understated backseat. But as one of the TT's proponents said, we've progressed from understatement to statement. As Abraham Lincoln may have said, you can please some of the people all of the time, all of the people some of the time, but you can't please all of the people all of the time. So if you've got a sizable subset of people raving about your product, produce it as fast as possible. Now began the serious business of turning the TT concept into a production car. 
The engine's power was deemed not enough to give the TT the necessary excitement, maybe because the car was coming in 100 kilograms heavier than the A3 with the same engine. So the base model increased from 150 horsepower to 178 horsepower, with the top of the range now at 222 horsepower, producing 0 to 60 times of 7.1 and 6.4 seconds respectively. This being a driver's car, the only gearbox would be a six-speed manual. The initial idea was to only offer quattro four-wheel drive, but Audi changed their mind, producing an entry-level front-wheel drive five-speed manual to tempt customers in the door. And me being the frugal penny pincher, that's the one I plumped for. With no space at Audi's main design center in Ingolstadt, the team decamped to separate facilities. And that separation maybe helped keep the uniqueness of this car. It wasn't just an A4 made a little smaller with a hatchback or an extended A6 with more luxury. This was something unique and different. Although the final production car would look almost identical to the concept, the team had to start from scratch to create a car that could be built en masse rather than a very pretty one-off. One noticeable difference was the addition of a rear quarter light, which gave the TT more daylight in the cramped rear seats. Normally a rear spoiler would keep the car planted at high speeds, but the team created panels underneath the car that eliminated that need, keeping the absolute shape of the original concept. Nothing was too much work to keep that absolute shape. On the coupe, it proved to be difficult to manufacture the sharp transition between the rear of the roof and the body. The normal solution would be to cover it over with a chrome or a plastic strip, but this would have compromised the style. 10 people worked on and off over two years to come up with a manufacturing solution that produced a no compromise shape. The team was given a tight deadline. Just 12 months from the first concept being shown, a pre-production car needed to be drivable. Even with using a standard chassis and transmission, this was an aggressive goal. What's more, the A3 suspension used on the concept was found to be, well, like driving an A3 and the brakes couldn't cope with the additional power. The team had to develop new suspension that gave the car the sporty handling it deserved. Audi TT launched at the Paris Motor Show in the autumn of 1998, and the public rejoiced. Finally, they could own the TT, and Audi hadn't watered down the design. They were surprised to find the tiny car had a surprisingly large boot that was even larger with the rear seats folded down. Cars started rolling out of Audi's new factory in Hungary that had already been producing the four-cylinder engine used by the TT. The TT design was so loved, in fact, that companies like Banham Designs decided to create their own love letter to the styling, the X99, which might look the part, but underneath it was actually an Austin Metro. Audi took a dim view to what they saw as a blatant ripoff and told them to stop. With the coupe launched, the following year, the open top arrived, now renamed the TT Roadster. The soft top had the option of being manual or electric, but the extra space meant that there were no rear seats. The playful touch of baseball glove stitching also made it to the production car's interior. Audi had a hit car on their hands, but very quickly ran into a crisis. There were a series of crashes, some fatal at high speeds due to the rear wheels losing grip. It seems when cornering the car could swerve abruptly, something that could catch out inexperienced drivers. Audi's blurb had confidently stated they'd fixed rear instability without the need for a rear spoiler using panels underneath the car. That was clearly false. The company rushed to fix it. All subsequent cars got revised suspension, including stability control or ESP as standard. And most importantly, each new car got a rear spoiler. Existing owners could of course come in for a retrofit. Purists decried the spoiler ruined the TT's lines but it made the car safer to drive. The TT was a lot of fun, and in sports trim it won the German DTM series in 2002, but the consumer version always lacked power compared to rivals like the Nissan 350Z that launched in 2002. 
So in 2003, the TT got a larger 3.2 liter VR6 engine delivering 247 horsepower that got to 60 in under six seconds. Audi also started offering an automatic DSG or direct shift gearbox. This gave the automatic almost instantaneous gear shifting, meaning for most people, the automatic accelerated faster than the manual. Audi's coupe got faster in 2005 with the limited edition TT Quattro Sport. The 1.8 liter increased its power to 237 horsepower. After ditching the spare tire, rear parcel shelf, rear seats, and air conditioning, the new TT accelerated as quickly as the 3.2 liter VR6 making some wondering, why not just buy that car? Maybe the sick paint scheme, okay, it had a black roof, persuaded 1,165 customers to part with their money. A year earlier, Audi had announced that they were working on a second generation TT. The public got a hint of what the design might look like with the Audi shooting brake concept in 2005 with its Renault Megane posterior. The new TT broke cover a year later, some manufacturers chose to leave iconic shapes almost the same, like successive generations of the new Mini. Some chose to evolve the design, such as the Mazda MX-5. That's the direction Audi chose to take. The designer, Walter De Silva, who'd penned the glorious Alfa Romeo 156, decided to move away from the Bauhaus theme with a grown-up body, reusing and reinterpreting design elements from the original car. He also wanted it to look sportier this coming from the man who just penned the fabulous Audi R8. Customers wanted more interior space and the designers took this on board. The goal was to make the cabin more airy while keeping it intimate. The original car's slit light front window felt, to me at least, like sitting in a tank. The dashboard was an evolution of the original design, now with space for a large screen to allow for a decent navigation system. The same could be said for the exterior that shook off its Bauhaus styling for something closer to the rest of the Audi family. Audi's mantra for the second generation was it's sportier and it's lighter. But although the new aluminium space frame chassis was 90 kilos lighter than the previous car, when all the bells and whistles were added to the base model, it ended up 20 kilos heavier. The original TT Vision didn't include a spoiler, so the new car had one that popped up at high speeds to keep the car stable. The handling was improved and even got better with the optional MagnaRide active suspension from Delphi. The engine list started off with a 2 litre and the previous 3.2 litre, both a little faster and a little more fuel efficient. It would be joined by a 1.8 litre in 2007, along with the open top Roadster. The new car's improved handling meant it now drove as good as it looked. The press loved it. It won Top Gear's Coupe of the Year and Fifth Gear's Car of the Year in 2006. What car crowned it Best Coupe of the Year in 2007 and for the next six years? In 2007, Audi showed off the TT Club Sport Quattro concept, an extreme version of the TT with no roof or windscreen to speak of, and you'd better live somewhere where it never rains because there was no soft top, and with low rollover hoops, you took your life in your hands with this 300 horsepower beast. There was talk of a limited production run, and Audi updated the concept with a taller windscreen a year later, but the concept never made it to production. What the Audi did get was a diesel engine combining great fuel economy with a good 0-60 time of just over 7 seconds. You also got a diesel rattle to go with your tuned TT exhaust burble. For those wanting more performance, the TTS boosted the 2-litre engine to 268 horsepower, getting to 60 around 5 seconds. And a year later, the TT RS arrived with 335 horsepower, arriving to 60 in 4.3 seconds. To do this, it used a heavily modified version of the 2.5 litre 5 cylinder engine from the US version of the Jetta. Audi hoped these models would breathe some more excitement into the range, but although sales of the second generation car initially matched the first generation, they quickly dropped off and the TTS and the TTRS didn't help them recover. In 2010, the TT got some small mid cycle refreshes, such as new paint options and revised headlights. The 3.2 litre VR6 was dropped. It didn't seem to make much sense as the 2 litre engine was faster and more economical. 
We might think that autonomous cars are a recent thing, but in 2010, Audi let the TTS drive itself up Pike's Peak with the help of Oracle and, according to this picture, a Netgear wireless access point. It completed the trip at a breakneck average speed of 45 miles an hour. The first the public got to see of the third generation was the interior of the 2014 Consumer Electronics Show in Las Vegas. The reason? Well, Audi wanted to show off its high-tech all-digital instrument cluster, one of the first cars to get one. It allowed Audi to remove the central screen, but it meant it needed one of those mousy handwriting recognition joystick controller things next to the gear stick, so you felt you were entering text like you were using a Palm Pilot. Other than the screen, the new interior was an evolution over the second generation car. That car had three central air vents meant to look like jet engines, and the new interior took that to the next logical level, looking even more like tiny little jet engines with displays in the vents showing the temperature. Like the rest of Audi's range, the manual handbrake was gone, replaced with the dreaded flippy button that seemed to take forever to activate. A month later, Audi teased sketches of what the car would look like, and a month after that, the final car appeared at the 2014 Geneva Motor Show. Like previous cars, it shared the platform with the A3 and a slew of other cars from the Volkswagen family. The shape was clearly an evolution from the previous generation, but it also towed the Audi party line with styling cues that would show up on future Audi models. But this made it much less distinct than the original. By putting the car on another diet, it was now lighter than both the second and the first generation car. With the combination of 2.0-litre petrol and diesel engines, it allowed the car to become even faster and more fuel efficient than the previous generation. And when the press got to drive it, they found the performance and handling matched the looks, but there were better handling cars on the market. Six months later, the Roadster arrived with an electric folding soft top with improved soundproofing. Along with the new car came a series of concepts. First was the TT Quattro Sport with 420 horsepower. Next was the TT Sportback. The TT grew a set of rear doors, making it look less like something out of a Bauhaus styling guide, and more like a current A3 sedan. Then there was the Audi TT Offroad that turned the TT into what a next generation Q3 might look like. By this time, the original Bauhaus lines had all but disappeared, but it had the TT's interior, so it must be a TT. These concepts in the third generation car showed that the TT had abandoned all roots of the absolute styling of the original car. This was a small coupe with Audi corporate styling. It wasn't the personal expression that had drawn customers to the original car. Not surprisingly, none of these concepts reached fruition and customers failed to fall in love with the third generation TT with lacklustre sales. Having said that, sales tend to go down over time, as can be seen if you overlay Mazda MX-5 sales, but it's clear that the third generation car didn't generate the same level of excitement as the original TT. To try to generate that excitement, Audi gave the car yet more power. The TT Club Sport Turbo concept generated 600 horsepower from a 2.5 litre 5 cylinder, giving it stupidly fast acceleration that most definitely needed a rear spoiler to keep the back end planted. That would remain just a concept, but in 2016 you could buy a new version of the TT RS, again with a 2.5 litre 5 cylinder engine driven through all four wheels, generating only 395 horsepower with a sub 4 second time to 60 miles an hour, faster than the previous generation. But maybe, just maybe, customers weren't looking for more power that they couldn't use on the road in any case. After all, the 3.2 litre VR6 didn't boost sales back in 2003. A facelift in 2018 didn't improve things. In 2019, Audi announced there wouldn't be another TT. The car bowed out with a series of goodbye special editions. By November 2023, the last car rolled off the Hungarian production line. Maybe the stylists of the second and third generation car were stuck between a rock and a hard place. On one hand, they had a popular car with a unique style. Maybe something completely different would surely alienate existing customers. And didn't Porsche keep reinterpreting their 911 for a new generation? And that car kept selling and selling and selling. So 
don't rock the boat, make something that looks like a new TT, but make it a little bigger because that's what customers want. The original TT was an amazing, unique shape. The new hit ideas don't exactly grow on trees. Stylists, after all, are just human beings at the end of the day. The TT was a rarity for Audi, a design leap into the unknown. Something new and different that could excite or repulse. Peter Schreyer, head of Audi Design, said of the original car, the TT is the absolute opposite of what is commonly referred to as a car designed by a committee. I'm not sure you could say the same thing about the second or third generation car. As I mentioned, the first TT sketches were shown to Audi's management two months after the Renault Argus appeared, although I don't know if Freeman Thomas used it as a direct reference. However, a car that came from the same Renault design studio, the Twingo, had almost the same story as the TT. It was a design that split opinion, with some hating it, but many loving it, and it also went through three generations, with the second and third generations losing the absolute styling of the original. Audi is now focusing on electrifying its range, but the TT was never about the powertrain. The base model was fast enough, but it wasn't amazingly quick. That wasn't the point, it was about the style and attention to detail. If Audi wants to energize its range, it needs to use more than electrons. It needs a shot of design that will excite like the original Audi TT. If you want to know more about the Twingo, there's a video on the right. Also, Mazda made their own sports car in the 1970s, the RX-7. They were the only company that made the Wankel rotary engine work. It made for a unique experience, and there's a link to that as well if you're interested. Thanks for watching, and I'll see you in the next video.